Well, hello everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in to this uh, third and last part. Um, so we're going to keep uh, going with our exploration of the statistical landscape and keep positioning genetic models and, 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 and genetic an and analysis in general within this landscape. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed the previous parts about heritability and she was. Um, and so we're going to keep going um, with prediction. Um, the first one being best linear and vice prediction um, called BLOP. Um, so the BLOP, especially in genetics, um, was introduced by Robinson um, in one of these, well, several papers, but this one is actually a pretty good read that BLOP is a, is a good thing. Uh, the model formulation, so we recognize here a linear mixed model again. Um, so X equal XB, Y equal XB, sorry. Um, and so the idea here is to take the estimates of beta, so beta hat, um, times that um, by a new SNP matrix X from a new sample um, to derive a SNP based prediction. So that's the idea behind BLOP. In practice, we estimate BLOP from summary statistics, which is called SBLOP. Um, and so we take the betas uh, from the GWAS. Um, the SBLOP method allows them uh, allows to transform those effects into marginal effects B um, by using a reference LD matrix. And, and then once we have those um, B hats, uh, then we can apply them to a new sample um, to derive a prediction from the whole gene. Um, another PRS, uh, which Adrian mentioned before, and you may have heard in, in, in your reading and in your analysis, is the base R or S base R predictor. Here, the ID, we still in a linear mixed model framework. Um, but here we have several X's, X1, X2, X3, which correspond to um, bins of SNPs. So we are not fitting all the SNPs in a single random effect, but rather um, fitting them in several in a mixture of components. Um, so here, the trick is to separate SNPs by math. The idea behind this is that SNPs of different maps cannot be in high LD. Um, well, the converse being true in that if you want two SNPs in high LD, they have to have the same map or similar map. Um, so in practice, what this means is, is that we have relaxed the hypothesis of a single distribution, which we have often in, in the AC twin model or, um, or in, in when we estimate SNP heritability. Um, but in practice, this means that we can have a much better fit um, to the data because we, we relax our assumption of a single distribution of, of effect size SB. Um, in practice, this can be done using the software called GCTB, uh, and it, it also takes in summary statistics um, to make the computation easier. Another fairly advanced model, you which you probably have heard about, is this LDPRED or LDPRED2 model. Um, so here, we can still write the model under this simple form y equal um, x beta, x b plus e, um, except, sorry for the typo, except that b here is a random, uh, randomly distributed um, 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 random effect variable, um, but only with a probability p, and uh, it takes a zero value otherwise. So in practice, this means that we have a mixture between a random effect distribution on B and, and then just a massive, um, and, and then a zero, a bar of zero. Um, so this is a bit more, a bit closer to the, I guess, a true model in which we would have a set of causal SNPs P and then all the non-causal SNPs um, have a, a, an association of zero. So they do not contribute. Um, as you can see here, well, there's an extra parameter P, which needs to be estimated and, and is now estimated automatically in LDPRED2, but was not in LDPRED. So this is what the actual paper, um, how they write um, the distribution. So you see it's very close to what they had before, except that there's this zero um, for um, a certain number of SNPs. So you can find all of this in this LDPRED2 paper. All right, so we've seen a few methods for polygenic risk scores. Um, well, the middle of the question is which one should I use? And um, there's no 
um, definite answer to this. But there has been some uh, evaluations recently, including this one by Gianni, um, where um, they compared um, 10 polygenic risk score methods um, and applied them onto multiple cohorts for um, predicting psychiatry um, um, diseases or conditions. Conditions. So you can see here the um, pruning, clumping plus thresholding, which is the simplest form of the PRS. Here, the S block that I mentioned before, LD pred with different variations, LD pred 2, um, and an S base R, which is here. Um, so here you can see already that the plot um, shows the prediction accuracy on the y axis across four different. Um, um, cohorts, which are the different uh, dashed bars. And then the models are organized in, into um, several sections. So here's the benchmark tuning sample, very simple. Um, here, the inf infinitesimal model, uh, meaning that they assume a single distribution of 4B. Here, um, well, it's more complex genetic architectures where we can have mixtures or, or mixture of zero and associated components, etc., etc. But what we can see is that outside of the simpler um, pruning, clumping, and thresholding methods, um, the others perform relatively comparably. Um, and the two that seem marginally better uh, seem to be LD PRED2 and this other. This is for schizophrenia case control, um, but you can find a lot more results in this paper, which are, it's definitely worth a read. Okay, um, now how do we evaluate and what model do we use to evaluate the prediction accuracy of a PRS? So I'll just um, remind you um, this, which has already been explained by Adrian, but just to um, recapitulate, we have our GWAS sample discovery on which we estimate the effect sizes of the SNPs. And then we have a separate independent GWAS target sample on which we calculate the PRS. And this is the sample in which we're gonna evaluate the prediction accuracy. Um, well, this is um, often done uh, using a linear um, model where we have uh, the PRS here, the, the association between the PRS and the variable of interest, and then covariates, which we want to uh, control for. Um, so that's the simple case. Um, well, now, what about we want to do, um, we have a PRS calculated, but it's in a sample with a structure. So let's assume a twin sample. Um, where we would now cannot assume that our observations are completely independent, um, mostly because, for example, our MZ twins are going to have the same PRS value um, because they are genetic uh, clones. So here what we can do is actually model this um, population structure while estimating the prediction accuracy of the PRS. So Z is now our matrix of fixed effects, uh, which includes covariates and the PRS. And now we can fit a random effect, so which can be C, uh, for example, uh, which can be the shared environment effect. Um, so the idea behind this is that we do not want our prediction accuracy from the, uh, of the PRS to be contaminated by shared environment or uh, additive genetics, for example, so we can control for A and or C in the model. In a very uh, simple way of doing this, um, well, this is the example of the CE control. So we have a linear model here where uh, we have BMI as a function of our covariates and our PRS for BMI. And here we further control uh, in this mixed model for family ID um, as fitted as a random effect, which is equivalent to fitting C, um, this shared environment random effect in the model. Okay, another um, genetic model, uh, which has been mentioned several times this week, I'm sure, is the Heisman elston regression, um, which originated from this paper in 1970, and uh, um, which is also described in several papers, uh, but including this one by Peter Vischer. Um, and so this um, is the equation for the Heisman elston regression. And as you can see, it's again, a linear model, except that we are not working with the standard phenotype and the standard SNPs, but rather we're working with the cross product of the phenotype and of the genetic values, which the cross products of the, of the genotypes being the GRM elements. Um, so that's why we have basically for X, each ZIJ, which is the cross product of the phenotype for two individuals I and J. Um, but we, we regress that um, on the GRM 
of diagonal elements uh, or, or element for i and j. And we can see that um, throughout a few equations and rearrangements that basically um, the linear estimates B um, is, um, is the, the genetic variance, which can give us a, um, a, well, an estimate of the heritability this way. So this is quite clever. Where Hazeman Elston becomes difficult is, is when it comes to association testing, of course, because each of these pairwise zij are not independent with any zi something or zj something. Um, so we don't have independent observation, then it becomes hard to estimate or to test um, or to get unbiased uh, estimates of the standard errors. If you want. Just to highlight the fact that, um, so we now have a lot more elements than we had before. So let's assume we have a thousand individuals. So now we regress each cross product of those pairwise individuals with, um, with the GRM a corresponding element. So, and we have, n times uh, n minus one divided by two unique pairwise relationships between our, our individuals in the sample, which means that we go from a thousand individuals to almost 500,000 observation for this regression. So it is a simple linear model, but it's extremely, it can be actually quite, quite tedious and difficult to estimate those effects. Um, so in the recent paper um, by Valentin Hiver, which I mentioned before, they actually perform HE regression on the whole UK Biobank. And I think that they had to cut it down into um, smaller samples and then meta-analyze the different samples because the regression was getting too big. Okay, I'd like to come back maybe a bit on longitudinal models because you may have seen random effects models being um, introduced for uh, their use on longitudinal data. So I'd just like to sort of show a bit um, how that relates with the rest. So we can write the longitudinal model as, um, as a mixed model again, with uh, fixed effects, Z, um, age, sex, and size, again. Um, but now we have this T random effect, um, which can model the effect of time, basically. Time, visit, or wave, or however you parameterize it, which is important. But basically, this TRM matrix, um, it's zero, on all the elements, except for when it's the same individual who comes back, the observation that identifies the same individual. So just to show on a simple data set, here we have reaction time as a function of um, number of days um, of sleep deprivation. Um, but you can see that, so this is all the observations we have in the model. Actually, these observations are not independent because we only have, I think it's 18 individuals here which are measured across time. Um, so our T matrix could be basically a matrix that, that indicates which are the observations that come from the same individual. And that's a way of modeling the structure of the data. So I hope the connection is quite, um, is quite direct with, with what we've seen before, for, for example, for the ACE model, where we have an assumed um, dependency between observation, which are people from the same family. Here we have a known dependency between observations, which is time or um, the fact that it's the same individual which comes up, who comes back. Okay, so let's start with um, the simple, simplest model again, and then complexify. So here we start with uh, a GLM, a gener generalized linear model which is the reaction time as a, as a function of the days of sleep deprivation. So we estimate um, an intercept, uh, which is here around 250, and then a fixed effect um, relationship um, between um, reaction time and days of sleep deprivation. Okay. So, so far, so good, simple model. What we've forgotten here to model is actually the fact that the, uh, all the observations are non-independent because they, um, a lot of them come from the same individuals. Um, so that's what we can measure here using um, a, a mixed um, intercept. So here we still have our fixed effects, um, time B, but we have now a random effects T0, uh, which is a random effect following a normal distribution uh, of non-violence of command. Um, and what this means is that we still estimate this regression line in black, but now we also estimate one parameter per individual, um, um, which allows 
the, the individual to vary slightly from that group average. Um, so, but we, the constraint that we had is that each of the, basically the distance of each individual to the black line follows a normal distribution. Here is your random intercept. Well, now we can complexify the model and, and fit a random intercept, but also a random slope. And so that means that now we estimate two extra parameters per individual, uh, which is how much they vary from the, um, the average regression line in terms of shift, so um, intercept and slope slightly. Um, and again, all those distributions are drawn from each, every time a single distribution. What's also interesting in this model is that we can estimate the correlation between the random slope and random intercept, um, which um, as an interpretation, for example, uh, do people who start from a high value, do they progress or do they um, faster or, or less fast than, than the others? Um, so I hope with this example that it helps sort of bridge the gap a bit between what we've learned about um, random effect models for genetics and, and random effect models that are more commonly used, I guess, um, uh, for the long, um, longitudinal models. Okay, and I promised I would touch on some before concluding. Um, and yes, yeah, so as I mentioned before at the beginning of section two, that you can see um, statistical equation modeling as a generalization of uh, the linear mixed model framework. And by this, I meant that you can see some as basically a set of linear mixed models, which you are trying to solve all at once, and you can estimate the likelihood of this model and then test nested models and everything. So I've started from the, this um, path diagram, which shows a quadrivariate twin model. Um, so it's um, from the Neil, um, Mess and Carden book. Um, and then basically, just to show you how this some model translates into this equation, it's basically a set of equations that we're solving now. So P1, the phenotype one, is a function of A1 and um, A1 and E1. P2 uh, is a linear function of A1, A2, um, E2, uh, E1, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have uh, known variance covariance stru structures for A1, A, A2, A4, et cetera, and for E1, E2, et cetera, et cetera. So just to show you that um, you know, what we're doing in OpenMX and what you're doing sometimes in OpenMX is just to, to do something even more complex. So that includes multivariate models. So here you clearly have several outcome variables that are of interest, or more complex structures between the latent structures and the random effects and uh, or multi-level um, variables. Okay, if I were to summarize everything in one slide, I think it would be this one. Um, so here you have on the left hand side the, the type of models, so um, GLM, random effect model, linear mix models, and stru st structural equation modeling. Um, a rough formula that shows you a bit how they relate with each other. Statistics of interest, so going from the correlation coefficients to variance components and R squared, measurement of R squared. Uh, and then a bit of a list of some of the applications. So from testing association or Hazeman Elston for um, JLM um, to estimating AE, uh, ACE models, ACE with covariates, uh, potentially test uh, the prediction accuracy of, of uh, PRS in the twin sample. Um, and then all the way to um, some where you can have complex LMM models, uh, model the, the genetic um, correlation between, between phenotypes or trace of interest, common independent pathway models, which are more complex models with um, a more complex random structure. And I've listed some of the R packages or functions which you can use um, for some of the effects. So you can have a look and, and play with them. So thank you very much for your attention throughout all these, um, all these presentations. I'd like to just finish on a very quick summary, um, just to emphasize the fact that the different models we use a lot of the time share some common theory and concepts, um, namely the likelihood which allows for testing, but allows seeing all of these as um, a complex um, part of the same family of models. Um, just to keep in mind, random effects models can accommodate low and high dimensional data, observed or latent variables, as long as you know the known variance covariance.
And I hope that seeing all these models in perspective can help you um, or can give you new ideas about how to approach research questions or develop new methods. Thank you very much for your attention.